When I was a boy, I would always have some rather strange thoughts come into my mind. I'd be lying in bed at night at the young age of 8 or 9 wondering what happens after you die, or what came before the Big Bang, and stuff like this would obviously put me into a full-blown panic. There were multiple times where I'd be in my room, minding my own business, playing the latest MMO or first-person shooter. Hours would pass sometimes, and obviously I would end up getting parched. This is where it gets kind of weird, so bear with me. When I had to go down to get something, I thought my parents would turn into their real identities. Aliens. But they'd always flick the switch back to the human mode by the time I made it to the bottom of the staircase. Now, I obviously knew the truth, but I never brought it up, because I didn't want to get probed or anything. I wanted to stay on the aliens' good side for when the inevitable takeover happened. But yeah, my point is there was a lot of things, and usually they were ridiculous. But they would all put me into an existential crisis mode and cause me to lose sleep at night. Now, that could be caused by multiple things, whether that be from my overactive imagination that thought a rogue black hole was going to suck the planet off as soon as I closed my eyes at night, or childhood depression my smooth brain could never understand. Who knows? But anyway, to deal with my apparent trauma, I'm going to try and put you through the same thing I experienced. This video is going to take a dive into possible civilization-ending scenarios. The good stuff. The stuff big science doesn't want you to know about. We'll start off with naturally occurring scenarios to appease all of the climate change deniers that watch my videos. Up first, we have asteroids. If you didn't know, asteroids are just small, rocky bodies of mass left over from the formation of our solar system. They exist in space along with everything else. There have been dozens of mostly terrible movies that Hollywood has put out. Sorry, Nicolas Cage. And all of these movies depict the same thing. What happens when an asteroid hits? What do the people in power plan on doing to stop it? The movies might suck most of the time, but they still make you pucker your sphincter when you reach the climax. Regardless, asteroids are one of the many interesting things about space. And what's not to love about floating rocks from billions of years ago? Or roughly 2,000, depending on your beliefs. You know, other than that whole mass extinction event thing that the dinosaurs went through. It's not our problem. But the question still stands. What are the odds of something like that happening again? Each and every day, there's over 100 tons of space gunk that picks Earth as its drop point. Can't really blame them since tilted towers are way too crowded. But most of the time, it isn't even asteroids. It's usually just cosmic dust and Teslas. Shout out Elon Musk. Almost every week, there's a news article with a clickbait title saying an asteroid capable of leveling a playground is headed directly to a school near you. And that's pretty threatening sounding. I agree. Nobody wants little Jimmy's last moments to be him getting picked last in dodgeball. That's just upsetting. Earth experiences frequent collisions with small asteroids. In most cases, these asteroids don't have enough energy to reach the surface. They tend to break up by the time they reach the atmosphere. Thankfully, the kind folks over at NASA have found over 90% of the large asteroids that come in close contact with the Earth. They use something known as the Torino Scale, which is a method for categorizing the hazard associated with near-Earth objects. This scale ranges from a 0 to 10, and the values are based on the chance of collision and the energy released by the collision. 0 being meaningless, insignificant, good for nothing, etc. And 10 being, oh god, oh fuck, I wish I didn't live with all this regret. 99.9% .9 of the time, this scale never goes over 1. But that doesn't take us out of the realm of possibility, as there is always a chance a rogue rock we missed comes from downtown to break us from this mortal coil. An example of this is the near-Earth asteroid named Apophis. In 2004, this asteroid was discovered. At that time, it was indicated that this asteroid had a 2.7% chance of striking Earth on April 13th, 2029. This put it at a 4 on the Torino scale, the highest we've ever seen. But through further observations, the chance of this event ever happening were eliminated. Sorry for getting your hopes up. So what size asteroid would it actually take to cause a global panic? That's a very good question, my cherished viewer. My much appreciated viewer. My absolute favorite viewer. Yeah, you. Right there. I'm looking at you. For the dinosaurs, it was estimated that the asteroid was 10 to 15 kilometers wide, or 30 to 50,000 feet, or 250 to 420 football fields, or roughly 16,000 chickens. It's believed that if an asteroid like this were to hit the Earth today, billions of lives would perish. The vast majority of any form of life would be gone in a moment, but there would still be a few cockroaches and Twinkies lying around. To completely eviscerate all life on the planet, an asteroid would have to be almost 100 kilometers wide. And the chances of that happening are astronomically low but never zero. And I hope you never let that thought leave your head. Next up, we'll take a look at a League of Legends player's worst nightmare, the solar flare. A solar flare occurs when the sun's magnetic field gets all jumbled and scrambled around, causing giant storms of electromagnetic energy to form on the surface. Now, when these storms are observed, they can be seen as dark splotches known as sunspots. Around these sunspots, magnetic field lines of the sun twist and snap, causing huge flashes of energy, which is what we know as a solar flare. The energy that solar flares produce is mostly dissipated as ultraviolet light and other science mumbo-jumbo. But sometimes other, more spooky stuff happens. Alongside solar flares, another type of event happens when the sun's magnetic field twists and bends, creating gigantic blobs of charged particles known as coronal mass ejections. 
These blobs carry enormous amounts of heat and get launched with great speed by the energy they release. These ejections can reach Earth in about 15 hours, but typically take several days. That's a pretty leisurely stroll compared to a solar flare, which can reach Earth in just over 8 minutes. So what the heck does any of that mean? Not much usually. The Earth is typically quite good at protecting us from space weather and other events. We've all lived through dozens of CMEs and solar flares. And we haven't even realized it. And that's because of the Earth's atmosphere, along with its magnetic field. CMEs can trigger geomagnetic storms, which is a disturbance of the Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere that occur when these bursts of radiation from the Sun collide with our planet. When this happens, it just gets deflected towards the poles of the Earth, which result in what we know today as aurora displays. These light shows are typically confined to the poles, but during larger disturbances caused by CMEs, they can be seen in many different areas lower on the globe. None of this sounds scary. And that's because they're just typically something we don't have to worry about. But as we learned in the last topic, there's always levels to this. The majority of solar flares and CMEs that intersect with us don't affect daily life negatively. But for the majority of history, our livelihoods weren't based around machines powered by electricity, so we weren't even aware of the effects these events could have on us. An example of this is the Carrington event. In 1859, there was a man named Richard Carrington. He was an amateur sky watcher who was doing what he loved to do. Stare at the sun or some shit. But what he saw this time was astonishing. The number of sunspots just kept growing. He just had to sketch it. While doodling, he was suddenly blinded by the equivalent of a flash grenade, something he described as a white light flare. We know today that it was a CME. And the CME that he had just witnessed took less than 18 hours to reach the Earth. This is when the largest geomagnetic storm in history took place. The telegraph systems they had around the world began to fail. It was 1859, what do you expect? There was multiple reports of sparks flying from these machines, and the operators were getting shocked. What if something like this were to take place today? Surely it would have a severe impact on the planet. There would be widespread electrical failures, blackouts, livelihoods on the line. Large-scale electronics would be toast, meaning the entire grid your city runs on will be sent offline. Computers, pacemakers, satellites. This wouldn't be the end of humanity, but it would set us back quite a ways. But the majority of damage could be prevented so long as the engineers and people in charge were aware of it. Turns out the tech support guy asking if you turned it off and back on was onto something after all. If you identify as a person on the extreme right wing of the political compass, I suggest you turn this video off now before you get offended. The next topic is antibiotic resistant bacteria. I know there's a lot of people out there that think the most recent pandemic was a hoax put on by the government to control the population, and that vaccines administered are toxic and have the mind control serum in them. And yeah, I mean, you can think what you want, but I don't know. I I'm pretty grateful for modern medicine, honestly. Like, I, I can't even really imagine being alive before we knew about germs. Like, there were just people shitting in buckets and throwing it in the streets. There was just doctors going around guessing what was wrong with people. They had no idea what was wrong. If you got the flu, you were done. Dead. You had no chance. If you had a cough, they tied you down to exercise you. There were no antibiotics. There were no vaccines. That's terrifying. And we should be permanently grateful that there was smart enough people out there to make these developments. There's no one being forced into iron lungs for the entirety of their lives anymore. Now, there's obviously two sides to everything, and the other half of this story is laced with human stupidity. Even though we've got this far with medicine, there's still so many people. I'm talking millions of people that are against modern medicine as a whole. If you go on Facebook, there's hundreds of groups claiming that the influenza vaccine gave their nine-year-old son autism. It has nothing to do with the fact that their parents are related or anything. And this has allowed for multiple diseases to make a comeback. Measles, mumps, fucking polio. Polio. You've got the people that spend four business days a week at the walk-in clinic getting antibiotics for anything and everything. And the doctors that just hand them out. Stuffy nose? Here's some drugs. Male pattern baldness? Well, I don't have anything for that, but here, try this penicillin instead. And these are all really bad, yeah, but the largest contributor to this problem is farming. About 90% of medically imported antibiotics sold in the US are for animals. Sure, there's multiple cases where these are actually used to treat illness, and that's great. But then you have these pigs that are being pumped full of human growth hormone and peptides so that they can get a few more pounds of bacon that they can sell to restaurants and supermarkets. This one is a tough topic because obviously farmers doing well financially is a great thing. Parts of the world having a larger supply of protein is also a good thing. But at what point does it become too great of a problem? When is the right time to start worrying about all these Mr. Olympia chickens running around? Bacteria gains resistance to antibiotics naturally. That's just how evolution works. If there's a threat, the power of science occurs, and from it births a new bacteria capable of going even further beyond. And I'm sure there's a lot of you out there asking how this even concerns you, or that it won't happen for years and years, we can just deal with it then. But the really cool thing is, is that it's already happening. During the first year of the pandemic, almost 30,000 people died from antimicrobial resistant infections. Nearly 40% of these people acquired that infection while in the hospital. 
And that was just because people with COVID were pumped full of antibiotics, even though they were useless against it. It was just too hard to distinguish between that and pneumonia at the time due to such similar symptoms. Over 1 million deaths occur each year due to antimicrobial resistance. This stuff can be prevented most of the time. If you don't need antibiotics, don't take them. If you're sick, stay home. And if you are an anti-vaxxer, I strongly urge you to keep your fertilizer to yourself. Please don't reproduce. Okay, I know this topic has been talked about a gorillion times, but with all this news coming out about the little green dudes lately, I just can't help myself. There has been speculation around aliens since 1450 BC, when poor Thutmose III atop the Mesa Jebel Bar Khal in Sedan had seen circles of fire above him, and fish that fell down from the sky. According to what has been translated off of the ancient sheets of papyrus anyway. I don't know, but in my opinion, this one's the most likely to happen. The whole Nazca mummy tiny goblin-like specimen bullshit's really getting to me lately. Yeah, they look like paper mache, and their insides look like nine-year-old cake, but I just want to believe in it, man. Even if it's not true and they are just wet paper, there's more and more UFO sightings popping up each day. It's only a matter of time at this point. And what the hell would an alien invasion even look like? Would they show up Independence Day style? Would Will Smith and his powerful right hand be our only hope versus these galactic entities? Or would it be more like, here's a bunch of gigantic black sunflower seeds? We're also 50 feet tall and speaking strictly Morse code and Rorschach tests. The more likely option is that whatever invades us will efficiently decimate and recreate the world to be whatever they'd like. If these motherfuckers have technology so advanced that they can do intergalactic travel and have what I can only assume to be ray guns as weapons, what option does the human race have at that point? It's like bows and arrows versus AC-130s. The only choice we have is if LeBron James and Michael Jordan team up with the Looney Tunes gang to take them on in a 1st to 11 basketball game. And I don't know if I'm ready to take that chance yet. The last topic in this video is obviously hypothetical, to say the least. But so is everything else that I've talked about, kinda, sorta. Beetle Uprising, baby! This is a highly unlikely event that I think about sometimes. There's only one real way it could happen. I call it the absolute specimen scenario. Spider-Man got his powers from a radioactive spider. Barry Allen got struck by a lightning bolt and became the Flash. Ant-Man got his powers because of ants. Yes, he did. Don't look it up. Fuck you. I'm right. So obviously beetles will get their powers from rapid and unprecedented mutation. This will end up giving them advanced cognitive abilities, such as problem solving and enhanced communication skills. Now that the brain is no longer smooth, the beetles rise from the dung and form a society of elite, the top 1% of the top 1% of beetles worldwide. The formation of strategies begins. They start branching out to other insect species through use of sophisticated military techniques like manipulation and bribery. So now there's a large scale insect army taking charge of humans. There's so many of them. They're so small. The power they have is limitless. They can infiltrate any facility and sabotage every important system they come in contact with. Slowly, the food and water supplies become theirs. Their agriculture and resource management is unmatched. This is what they were made to do. The downfall of humanity is rapid. Humans become increasingly reliant on the beetles for resources and survival. But the beetle is cold and heartless. Their eyes are empty. Their bodies, hollow. This only makes them tighten their grip on the power that they hold. Nothing, and I mean nothing, will make them give it up. This is what they long for. Every beetle that has been stepped on. Every bug that has been squished between fingers. Every fly that's been stuck in a bowl filled with one part apple cider vinegar, one part Dawn dish soap. They did it for you. Your sacrifices were not in vain. You will be remembered. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to leave a like and a comment. It would really help me out. And also, feel free to subscribe if you'd like to see future content similar to this.